The Z-transform is widely used as an analysis tool in signal processing. It turns out that the Z-transform is a generalization of the DTFT. In particular, it applies to signals for which the DTFT doesn't exist, thus allowing us to analyze those signals, and allows us to look at some new ideas in the sense of a system with respect to stability and causality. The Z-transform is the discrete time counterpart to the Laplace transform. So if you've seen the Laplace transform before, the Z-transform is used in a similar fashion. So we can define the Z-transform in equation form as x of z is just the sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity of x of n, z to the minus n. And z here is a complex number. So x of z is a complex function of a complex number. We can see the correspondence to the discrete time Fourier transform, which I've written out down here. We have x of e to the j omega is a sum from minus infinity to infinity of x of n e to the minus j omega n. So the difference here is that in the z-transform we're using z in place of e to the j omega, which is used in the discrete time Fourier transform. In fact, that tells us that the discrete time Fourier transform can be obtained from the z-transform by evaluating at the z-transform at z equals e to the j omega. So the DTFT, remember, is complex valued, but it's a function of a real valued parameter omega. So the z-transform generalizes that in that it's also complex valued, but now it's a function of a complex valued parameter z. Since z is complex, it's natural to define the z-plane or the complex plane as I've drawn here. We have the vertical axis is representing the imaginary part of z and the horizontal axis is representing the real part of z. So if I consider the set of points magnitude of z equals 1, it turns out that that's all points that have unit radius and that defines a unit circle. The relationship to the Fourier transform was when z was equal to e to the j omega. Well, e to the j omega is a point that lies on this unit circle. It has angle omega and unit magnitude. So x of z, our z transform, is defined over this plane, whereas the discrete time Fourier transform, x of e to the j omega, is defined only on this unit circle. And we can refer to this unit circle in terms of the magnitude of z equals 1, all z that satisfy that, or we can define it as z equals e to the j omega, equivalent descriptions. So what happens here is when we let discrete time frequency omega go from minus pi to pi, z equals e to the j omega goes once around the unit circle. So omega equals minus pi would be starting on the negative real axis, and then as we increase omega towards pi, we're going around counterclockwise one time. So since the discrete time Fourier transform is defined on this circle, you can see that as we continue to wrap omega outside of the minus pi to pi interval, we can go to uh, 5 pi over 2 or minus 3 pi and so on, that we're just going around this circle as we let omega increase, and that confirms the 2 pi periodicity of the DTFT because the DTFT is defined on this circle, and that cir this circle repeats every 2 pi. For notation, we're going to let x of n have z transform capital X of z, or sometimes we may write that in an operator notation that z applied to x of n gives us x of z. Now here's some examples. It's difficult, however, to graph something in four dimensions because z is complex, so we've got a two-dimensional plane, and we're graphing then height above that plane, but the height would also be complex. So what I'm showing in these two pictures is the magnitude of x of z. So if we let x of z equals z, then the magnitude of x of z looks like a cone at 0, 0. It has amplitude 0. So the magnitude of z just describes a cone. The further we get away from the origin, the taller the value of z comp becomes, and we end up with these circular cross-sections if you were to slice through it. Now on the right, I've shown something which has 
x of z equal to 1 over z minus 0 0.58. So in this case, we have an interesting situation because when z is equal to 0 0.58, in other words, it's on the real axis at that value, this is going to blow up to infinity. So obviously I can't display that graphically. I've chosen to sample the grid slightly off of that point. But what it looks like is you get a tent-like shape, like someone's pushing up a pole underneath a tent-like surface or a canopy. Well, we'll do some examples of computing Z-transforms in the next lecture.